the Buddha teaches breath meditation. He teaches sixteen steps in all. There are the most detailed meditation instructions that come in a canon. And it's the topic that he recommends most highly, most frequently. Because the breath is not only a place where the mind can settle down and gain some concentration, but it's also something that the mind can analyze. It's where all the, the insights that we need to gain for awakening can arise, while the mind is being mindful of the breath, being alert to the breath. And also conscious of how it relates to the breath. Because in the later stages of breath meditation, the emphasis is focused not so much on the breath, but more on the mind. The breath snares the mind and brings it into the present moment. You're with long breathing, you're with short breathing. And then from that point on, you train yourself. There's an element of volition. And the first thing you're supposed to train yourself to do is to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, be aware of the whole body as you breathe out. Because when the Buddha de describes concentration states, he doesn't say they're just one point. He says you're aware of the, the whole body. When there's a sense of rapture and pleasure that comes from the breath, you need that sense of rapture and pleasure to the whole body, the way that you would need moisture into a the flour that you're trying to make dough out of to make bread. Or you have a sense of the rapture welling up from within the body and filling the body, just like a spring of cool water coming up from a lake, filling the waters of the lake with its coolness. Or if lotus is standing in a lake, some of the lotus is not going above the water, but actually from the roots to the tips being underwater, totally saturated with the stillness and coolness of the water in the lake. Or if a person wrapped in white cloth, totally surrounded by the white cloth, so there's no part of his body that wasn't covered by the white cloth. These are all images of a whole body awareness. That's what you want to work on when you get to know the breath. Because the type of awareness that allows insight to arise is not just focused on one point. When you're focused on one point, there are a lot of blind spots in the mind. When you try to get a more all-around awareness, it helps eliminate the blind spots. In other words, you want to be immersed in the breath. One of the phrases they use for this, gaya katasati, is mindfulness immersed in the body. The body is saturated with awareness, and the awareness itself immerses into the body. It's surrounded by the body. So it's not that you're up in one spot looking at the rest of the body from that one spot or trying to block off the body from that one spot of awareness. You've got to have a whole body awareness all around, 360 degrees. So as to eliminate the blind spots in the mind. When the rapture and pleasure come from allowing the mind to be with the breath in this way, you allow them to suffuse the body and then die off when the body feels that it's had enough, when the mind feels it's had enough. You allow, allow these things to subside. And that's where you're focused on the mind in and of itself. When your awareness fills the body like this, at that point it seems like the breath and your awareness have melted into each other. And at that point it's hard to divide, draw a line between the two. And at this point you don't try. Allow the awareness and the breath to interpenetrate. You have to allow this awareness to get really solid. Otherwise it's easily destroyed.
because the tendency of the mind is to shrink up. As soon as we think, we shrink up certain parts of the body. That's why there's tension in the body every time there's a thought. This part of the body gets tense, so you can think that. That part of the body gets tense, so you can think this. Back and forth this way. So it's no wonder the simple process of thinking takes a lot out of the body. There are Chinese medical treatises that say that the person who, whose work is mental tends to use up energy three times at the rate of someone whose work is totally physical. And it's because thinking involves tension in the body. And particularly thoughts that go off into the past, off into the future, and they have to, ha have to re create whole worlds for those thoughts to inhabit. So when we're getting the mind concentrated, we're thinking solely about the present moment, observing solely the present moment, being alert and mindful to what's going on here. And in order to ensure that, you've got to keep your awareness as broad as possible. That's what really roots you in the present moment. Then you can start making that division between awareness and the breath. Up to this point, you've been manipulating the breath, trying to get more and more sensitive to what feels comfortable in the breathing and what doesn't, so that your manipulation gets more and more subtle, to the point we can drop that and just be with the breath. Now you try to manipulate the mind. The Buddha talks about gladdening the mind, steadying the mind, releasing the mind. In other words, as you get more and more used to the stages of concentration, you begin to gain a sense of which kind of concentration you need right now. Either if the mind seems, your awareness seems unstable, what can you do to steady it? What kind of state can you put it in? What can you focus it on that will steady the mind? When the meditation starts getting dry, what can you do to gladden the mind? And as you're beginning to move from one stage of concentration down to the next, exactly what do you let go that releases the mind from that particular factor? You know, when the Buddha talks about releasing the mind in this stage, it's not the ultimate release. It's more of the, the kind of release that's mentioned in some of the suttas. As you let go of directed thought and evaluation, you're released from the burden of those things as you go into the second jhana, and so on through the different levels of concentration. And as you do this, you begin to see how much those levels of concentration are willed. This is important. Insight comes while you're in concentration. As you move from one stage to the next, you begin to notice, almost out of the corner of your mind's eye, what you do to move from one experience of the breath to the next, one level of solidity to the next. And you see how much this is a produced phenomenon. This is what finally leads to the stages of breath meditation that are associated with insight. There's the insight into inconstancy, both in the breath, but more importantly in the mind. As you see that even these stable, very refreshing levels of concentration are willed. So that underlying all the refreshment, all the stability, there is this constant willing, willing to keep the state of concentration going. There's an element of burdensomeness there. We said the other day that insight into inconstancy or impermanence has very little to do with how you consume experiences and very much how to do with how you produce them. You see all the effort that goes into producing a particular type of experience. And the question becomes, why is it worth it? Isn't this burdensome, having to keep making, making, making these experiences all the time? Because if you don't make these states of concentration, what are you going to do? We go back to making other kinds of experiences. 
all of our experience from moment to moment to moment has an element of intention. There's an element of will. And you get to the point where that will, that element of intention, that element of will begins to seem burdensome. And particularly when you look around and say, well, who am I producing this for? Exactly who's consuming this? And you see that your sense of who you are, who this consumer is, It's difficult to find. It's difficult to pin down, because it's all made out of the aggregates, and the aggregates themselves are in constant stressful and not self. This gives rise to a, a quality that the text called nibbida, which can be translated either as dis disenchantment, disillusionment. Sometimes the translation gets stronger, revulsion. But in all the cases, it's a sense that you've really had enough of this. You feel trapped by this process. You want to find a way out. So you focus on letting go. You focus on first, there first there's this, this passion, then there's cessation, and then finally there's focusing on total relinquishment. In other words, in the final stage, you let go even of the path. even the perceptions and the thought constructs that make up the path. As you're gaining insight, they've, they've done their job, and then you can let them go as well. And all this takes place right at the breath, right at the point where the mind and the body meet at the breath. Which is why the Buddha never has you drop the breath as your point of meditation, as your topic of meditation, or as your theme. Simply that as you're staying here, you get more and more aware of what's going on. And it's a more of an all-around awareness, not only all around in the body, but also all around in the mind. You see through the blind spot that allowed you to consume experiences obliviously, forgetting the fact that you had to produce them as well. It's like watching a movie. Just two hours of lights flashing up on the screen. And then you later see a movie about what they had to do in order to make that movie, and you realize months, sometimes years of work went into it. And the question is, was, was it worth it? A few brief hours of enjoyment, and then you forget about it. In the meantime, all that work, all that suffering went into make that movie. So when you get that sense that the, all the effort it goes into production isn't worth it, that's when you really get disillusioned, disenchanted. That's when, when you can really let go. That's what has to be let go. It's not just letting go of perceptions as they come and go, but letting go of the, the creation of these things. And you see that it's all pervasive. If you don't let go, then that's what experience is all like. You're either creating skillful, skillfully or unskillfully, but there's a constant production every time there's an intention, every time there's a choice in the mind. And this is what begins to seem oppressive. This is what you finally impels you to let go. You let go of the producing. You let go of the creation. And that's the kind of letting go that really opens things up. The mind opens to another dimension entirely. That's not made up. That's not created. Where there is no arising or passing away. And that too is touched right here, although at that moment there's no sense of breath, no sense of body, no sense of the mind. As a functioning creator or consumer. When the Buddha talks about it, all the images are freedom. And that's about all that can be said. When you talk about it, but there's a lot that can be said about how to get there, and that's what the Buddha's teachings are all about. That's 
what this work is that we're doing right here at the breath. That's what it's all for. <laughs>